Hi everyone, and welcome to Uncovered Vintage Fashion Magazine Review. I'm Stephanie, and I've been collecting and selling vintage fashion magazines for over 20 years. And I'm Morley. I'm a former copywriter, and am now an award-winning playwright and screenwriter. Together, we will examine some of your favorite vintage fashion magazines from the 70s, 80s, and 90s. On Uncovered, we'll discuss some of the magazine's models, layouts, and did I mention the models? And we'll also review some of the ads and articles that make these magazines such a great piece of pop culture history. So, fashion your seatbelts and let's get uncovered! Hello and welcome to Uncovered Vintage Fashion Magazine Review Podcast. Today we're going to be discussing Cosmopolitan, October of 1989. So Steph, like I always ask you, do you remember anything that was going on in your life at this time, October of 1989? At that time in my life, I was probably just trying to figure out what comes next. How about you, Morley? I think around that time, I was just starting my career as a copywriter. I was really excited to be able to work in a creative field, so I know that was 1989. It was probably September, October 1989. Let's talk, though, about what was going on in the field of entertainment. So, for example, some of the top songs in October of 1989 were Miss You Much by... Janet Jackson, one of my very favorite artists. Right. Uh, Sowing the Seeds of Love. Tears, Tears for, fear. for Fears, um, Love Song by The Cure, mm-hmm. another great song, and uh, Listen to Your Heartbeat, or sorry, Listen to Your, what is it called? Is it Listen to Your Heart? Thank you. I can't read my own writing. Listen to Your Heart <laughs> by Roxette. Uh, some of the top movies at the time that were released, I should say, were The Punisher, which was eh, eh, not great, based on the Marvel comic book superhero or supervillain, uh, although in this movie he was a hero. There was Look Who's Talking. Remember that movie? Of course. Right? For sure. Uh, There was Crimes and Misdemeanors. Uh, Some consider this to be Woody Allen's best film. And another film that we've actually talked about before with Matt Dillon and Diane Lane, uh, Drugstore Cowboy. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Did you ever I don't think I did. Did you? I have seen it at least a couple times. Was it good? Well, if I didn't like it, I probably wouldn't have seen it more than once. Oh, it's <laughs> <So>, true. <laughs> anyway. Uh, Maybe someone was forcing you to see it. <laughs> so the answer is yes, I did like it. Thanks for asking. Maybe it was a date and it was a girl you just really wanted to go out with and she wanted to see the movie. <laughs> no. Okay, so... <laughs> so now that that's settled, again, we're going to be reviewing... Cosmopolitan, October of 1989. We have beautiful Michaela Berku on the cover. Berku? <laughs> okay, cool. <laughs> Photographer Francesco Scavulo, of course. Hair by John Sahag. Makeup, Fran Cooper. And clothing by Rifat Ozbak. Now, Rifat Ozbak is a Turkish-born designer. He had just won British Designer of the Year, the year, the prior, year prior in 1988. And... The clothing on this particular cover is Middle Eastern themed. I can see she, that. Yeah, she looks like a belly dancer. She does, yeah. There's actually a little bikini top she's wearing with pants, and um, there are coins hanging down I, from I don't the think, bikini top. I, I, they're not actual coins. It's a piece of metal that looks looks like dimes, but it's actually part of you know the belly dancer's outfit, the top. Yeah, it's styled to look like coins. Okay. And actually, it's it's stated further on in the issue. You didn't read this issue, did you? You know what? I guess I was reading all the other issues that we talked about. <laughs> so. But that looks like a typical belly dancer. They have the uh, uh, metal on the top. But continue on. No, I was just going to say that coins on clothing were on trend, and they, they talk about that a little bit further in this issue. But what I'm wondering about is, who's the designer again of the clothes designer? Refat Ozback. And what did this person win again, the top designer? British Designer of the Year. Well, they must have cleaned up in Turkey. Because you figure if they were the top British designer, they must have swept all the awards in Turkey. <laughs> That's my guess. <laughs> Go ahead. That's a pretty good guess. So, Michaela Berku, our cover model, she's mm-hmm. an Israeli model and actress. Okay. She's 19 years old in this photo. Okay. And she's six feet tall. Wow. She's been modeling since she was 13 years old. She had won a beauty contest for Elite Model Management, and that's what brought her to America. Now, doesn't this sound familiar just like our last guest 
Monica Schnarr? Yes, except so that she won Ford Supermodel right. of the World. But yes, that's right. yeah, very similar. And started also off very young. I guess it's a very good way to start. Uh, yes, yeah, so win a modeling competition like that. Wow. So this Cosmo cover takes is taken about a year after. Some of you may remember Michaela Burku on the cover of Vogue, just about a year before. Uh, it was a very controversial cover and. That's why I'm mentioning it. Okay. And we'll talk about it a little more in, a, in another episode. But basically, this was November 1988. It was the month and the issue that Anna Wintour took over for Grace Mirabella. She took mm. over the helm of Vogue magazine okay. as editor-in-chief. And again, Michaela was on, a, on the cover. And she was wearing jeans on the cover. And that's why it was a little bit controversial. There were some other reasons as well. But basically... The story went that there was a top and a skirt. It was an outfit, and the skirt didn't fit Michaela, so they put some jeans on her. And, I mean, jeans on the cover of Vogue at this time was absolutely unheard of. In other words, it wasn't in Vogue. And this was, well... (laughs) I'm on fire today, folks. (laughs) Oh, my goodness. Are you ever? Um, So Vogue is known for more, I want to say, higher-end clothing, and at the time... Jeans on the cover of Vogue was a little bit risque, but she went for it. Hmm, it was her first cover, and I have to say it did very well, and she's still, uh, yeah, she continued at the helm of Vogue. So there you have it, folks. We will discuss that more in another episode of Uncovered. Great. So let's go on to the... Some of the headlines? Some of, Thank you. <laughs> some of the headlines. So Cosmo's Guide to Single Bliss, plus Why Desirable Women and Men Avoid Marriage... Funny, sunny Dolly Parton, man's best friend. Thoughts on thin thighs. Say that ten times fast. I know. It's like a, it's like an enunciation test, right? Well, it's right? like alliteration plus. Yeah. Thoughts on thin thighs. Thought that. Go ahead. Diane Keaton, the total original. Do compulsions rule your life? I hope they don't. When a wife discovers her husband is bisexual. Ten dietary steps to prevent cancer. Do you want to own a beauty salon? No, thanks. Red Hot. John Cusack, and last but not least, Beverly Hills, the glitzy novel. And an excerpt from Amy Tan's best-selling The Joy Luck Club. Remember which, The course, Joy Luck Club? was made into a very, very popular movie. Yeah. So that's Cosmopolitan, October 89, and let's get uncovered. So Steph, I have a question for you. So what is my favorite time of the year? I'm going to say any time that there is a Three Stooges marathon going on. Well, that's true. You're right. However, my second favorite time of the year is Halloween. So when I asked you what you normally would do, let's say at uh, October of 1989, I know what I was doing. I was going to a really awesome Halloween party. And I love Halloween because it's really the one time of year for me personally, where I get to dress up and I love seeing other people dress up and going to these really awesome parties. So for me, I've always been a Halloween fanatic. And as it turns out, Our very special guest today takes Halloween to a whole new level. She has her own line of clothing, which is super impressive, and it's called Wicked Cat Clothing. So we'd like to welcome the creator and designer of Wicked Cat Clothing, Stephanie Long. Stephanie, welcome to Uncovered. Thank you very much for having me. I'm really excited. I appreciate being on here. Well, we're thrilled to have you. It's our pleasure. Yeah. So Stephanie, what is your background and how did you get started in fashion? Yeah, so actually when I was 18, right after high school, I thought I was going to be the next Calvin Klein. So I went ahead and signed up for the Art Institute of Seattle. Uh, I live in the Seattle area. And the first year was all about sewing and I already knew how to sew. So I was like, I'm going to drop out. I can't. This is ridiculous. Plus, I was told you're being ridiculous for thinking you're going to be the next Calvin Klein. So I felt my hopes and dreams were dashed. And I decided I need to enroll in real school. So I went to the University of Washington and got my degree in communications and then started out doing marketing. So marketing has been my background for about nine years now. However, during the pandemic, it was boring, locked at home. I thought, why don't I pick up my passion again? So I have been sewing and knitting my whole life for myself and sometimes for family members. So I thought, why not try this while I have nothing to do and see if it picks up steam? So last year, I decided to start designing. It's all about Halloween, cats, the paranormal, and horror movies, which I love. I have two cats. My house is decorated Halloween 24-7, 365 days a year. And horror movies, I watch them all the time. 
<laughs> so I absolutely love all that. And I can never find what I like. So I thought I'm going to design cool t-shirts with sayings or designs that are related to one of these topics or related to all of them. So I wear what I like now and I don't have to go out and search and find it. So that's how I got started with this. So I've been in it about a little under a year now been doing it and it's been extremely fun and I love it. That's, that's great. Great. Yeah. Can you tell us what were some of your favorite fashion magazines growing up? Okay, Cosmo I lived by and I actually lived with my grandma and I remember it comes once a month, right? I would be missing um my missing ep- what episodes, missing subscriptions um and so I remember I found a bunch of stack in the basement because she thought they were bad for people to be reading. So um, that is a funny story. And I knew now where they are hiding because she would intercept the mail. So Cosmo was one of them. Teen Vogue, Reg Vogue, 17. You know, I'd rip out those pictures of the hot guys and put them all over my walls. So but Cosmo was my thing. And apparently bad, bad, bad for my grandma. <laughs> and that's that is perfect again, because this is the issue that we're working on. Yeah. Or it's Octo- yeah. Cosmo. Yeah. October and some of the headings are pretty risque because I, I can exactly. see why your grandmother would want to shoot. But I was of age. I was 18. So it was really ridiculous. Anyways. Do so you have my... any fa- Sorry. Oh, I was going to say, anyways, that's more for my foray <laughs> into the magazine world for hiding them. <laughs> Do you have any favorite designers, hair, makeup artists, photographers? So I absolutely love Revolve. Now it's, I don't know if you've all heard of it. It's an e-commerce website, but every designer on there is amazing. Lauren Moshi. I love Calvin Klein. I, I love unique designs. So I love unique vintage. Um, they have a bunch of designs too. I'm very into the indie. I, while I do love Calvin Klein, I try and really support indie artists. And at this moment, I only wear my clothing now. So I can't say I've picked any new designer to wear, um, hair and makeup. So I absolutely love Jen Schlelp. I don't know if you've heard of her. She is the Kardashians makeup designer and hair designer. And, um, she has her own line of beauty products now. So I think it's really great. Hmm. So I want to ask you a question. So when did you first develop your interest in horror and the paranormal and, and Halloween? Yeah. So my very first movie, I will never forget this with my best friend in second grade was Pet Cemetery, And I remember not being, I love animals. So I was very sad about the cat dying. Sorry if anyone hasn't seen it. Um, but that was, <laughs> okay. That was my first foray into it. And my mom, surprisingly, she's very conservative, did not mind at all. And so she said, let's have you watch the exorcist. So that I watched next. And I know this is going to sound weird. It was really funny to me. And I, who knew? yeah, I, I mean, I have a picture of myself mocking the exorcist. I'm turning my head as far as I can. Uh, so I can remember those two. I was both in second grade and watched them and I, she didn't care. I just started watching them from there. Halloween was always big too in, in our house. My dad was a massive Christian and my parents divorced. So I think my mom did it to get back at him because Halloween was secular and bad. So for my mom, she was like, yeah, let's get you dressed up. And because I already had a love for these horror movies, I because Sabrina, the teenage witch I watched. So I became obsessed with witches. So I can tell you there has not been a Halloween since as long as I can remember that I've not done some sort of witch costume, even if it's just wearing a hat. I always have something witch wise. I love witches. I'm obsessed with them. So that's my foray into the horror world. <laughs> you know, earlier today, where uh, my mother in law, Stephanie's mother, asked us to uh, pick up a broom for her, I said, Was it for sweeping or for flying? <laughs> I don't think she liked that too much. I don't think she oh, did no. that so much. No. <laughs> Steph, if you were looking to put together a gift for a fan of the horror genre from Wicked Cat Clothing, what would you recommend? So I would recommend one of my collections. I actually have done this in conjunction with her name is Hollywood Haunted. And it's 
all of the femme fatales that are urban legends. So it lists a bunch on, we have it on t-shirts, on mugs, on what else, masks. So I would love to put together a package. I think it's super cool for those that love urban legends Mm. and movies based off of like Bloody Mary, movies based off of horror ladies that were bad killers, evil, what have you. So it's a super fun collection that I'm I love that I'm designing with her yeah but I saw Uh, you had a Jessica Rabbit one yes yes that was my own but um I also really do like Jessica Rabbit I've never dressed up as her but it says the Jessica Rabbit of witches because you know I just said I love witches so that's great that's confession I love your Bloody Mary yeah so that's cool yeah that's my best seller actually I started out blood with the Bloody Mary in the white but I had a a suggestion from somebody that follows me to do it in red. And I thought, why didn't I think of that? So now I have both red and white for Bloody Mary, but yeah, it's actually my bestseller. That's another story I should say. My friend that I watched Pet Cemetery with right after the movie, we went and did the Bloody Mary thing, whatever you want to call it. We only got twice to Bloody Mary twice because we were so scared and then ran out of the room. But now I say Bloody Mary three times all the time because it's in my clothing line. <laughs> Makes total sense. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And I assume you offer worldwide shipping. We're in Canada. So the you- Canada, the UK and the US. Okay. That's great. Excellent. So I have a question for you. Um, I'm also a screenwriter as well. And I noticed that some of those most popular films are those in the horror genre. Anytime I see, well, we're looking for screenplays, looking for screenplays, very few are looking for comedies, which is what I specialize in, but almost, let's say 80% are of the horror genre. Why do you think that is? What, what makes horror films, paranormal, so popular? Well, what's interesting is, um, like I'd mentioned, I'd done a paranormal podcast for about two years, and I was just really scared to get into it because it's not something people talk about. They don't talk about it at all. My grandmother was psychic, so I was raised to understand and be accepting of the paranormal. So I think once you get out there that you are, this is you, like you are into the paranormal. I think that there's just a floodgate that opens and people say, I'm into that too. I'm into that too, because I think it's not a tangible thing. So if you can't see it, how can you believe it? But people believe it because I think they can't see it and it gives them something otherworldly to believe like, like aliens, right? How can we be the only people on this earth? When you die, do you, are you really fully gone from this earth? I think it gives these questions that people really want answers to. Um, Bigfoot too. I think that's another good one. How can there be things that are just us out in the woods, right? I, or just regular animals. How is there not something supernatural out there? So I think there's just so many questions and there's so much good evidence to not contradict, which people want to contradict, but actually to validate that these things are there so I think that people just love talking about it and once you say you're into it they come on kind of like mental health right people are scared to talk about once you say I suffer from depression oh well I do too and I do too so you're not alone I think it's a really stigmatized still industry I think it's a good point I I think it's something that a lot of us can relate to I mean when we're talking about paranormal um, Stephanie and I have had uh, an experience with my late mother uh, mm-hmm. kind of playing practical jokes on us a couple times. Uh, some people we know have seen UFOs. Uh, so there's always something that someone can relate to. Mm-hmm. Exactly. Exactly. And, a spectrum. and you don't have to be all in. You can say, right. well, this happened to me. And you can believe you don't have to believe everything. You don't have to think the exorcist is a true story. Well, some actually, people it is, do. But it is, though. It's based and it on is. It's based on a true story. Yeah. But then the science will tell you one thing and you know paranormal will tell you another but it's not for everybody i mean here's the thing i mean Mm -hmm. uh not everyone loves comedies not everyone loves horror but i think it's really about relatability yes so i think that's what it boils down to yeah i also think because i am so into the paranormal horror movies are my favorite as you know but they don't scare me because it's not real. While some are based on reality, it's not actually reality that you're watching. So sometimes it's really hard to get me good, right? So I can mm-hmm. say Pet Cemetery, the old one, I'm going to say the new one sucked. Pet Cemetery, the old one, The Exorcist. I mean, they got me. Like they were good, solid movies. 
ones these days are kind of hard to get me, make me jump. I would say the one that made me jump recently was The Wretched. I, I don't know how recent it came out, but I just recently watched it. So that one did get me. Um, this is along the same lines, and you have mentioned a few already, but can you tell us what are your three favorite horror films of all time? Okay, so I'm going with The Exorcist. I'm going with Pet Cemetery. And then I'm actually going to go with The Wretched because I loved it so much. And it was based off of a witch, which I love. So the premise got me good. And I actually interviewed the main actress and she said they're coming up with two. So The Wretched 2 or whatever they're going to call it. So oh. I'm really excited. So I'd say the older the older Exorcist and then the Pet Cemetery. But I should say Emily rose i believe emily rose six, the six, six. Was emily rose yes yeah. that was that was that got me too i was scared of the alarm clock for a while that it would go <laughs> off it i think it was like three <laughs> too. Or something. so that one did get me as well so um, stephanie and i are friends with an actress i don't know if you've heard of her her name is michelle martin and uh, she was in a movie called howl which is very very popular she plays a character named alcina and also in coffin too so i don't know if you've seen any of the coffin movies uh, no, but is how does it have a werewolf on the cover? Yes, I believe so. Okay, I'm pretty sure I've seen that one then. Yes. Right. So how about you, Steph? What are your uh, Michelle favorite? is wonderful. Yeah, she's a fantastic actress. I'll look it up now. <laughs> yeah. Uh, what are some of your favorite movies, Steph? My favorite movies. Horror, horror movies. Horror movies, yeah, of course, are The Others. Have you seen oh. that with Nicole Kidman? Yeah, yeah, Nicole the Kidman. Yeah. Hands, love yep. that. The Sixth Sense. Yeah, that was very good. And Silence of the Lambs with Jodie Foster. I think that's, I didn't think of that one actually, now that you say that, but that is actually one of my, now I need to retract. No, no, no. What I said. On the record, folks, our listeners. I love Silence of the Lambs. And I don't know if you want to hear this side note. You know, it was based off of serial killers, right? And one of them was Ted Bundy. So the scene where the guy has someone back into a van because he needs help with his furniture is based off Ted Bundy. And my mom went to the University of Washington with Ted Bundy. And Yikes. She had a friend of a friend's cousin murdered by Ted oh Bundy. God. Yeah. Oh my God. So yes. she said he did that kind of stuff. And he was this charming, charismatic, smart. He was going to be a doctor, smart man. Wow. And she totally could see that you would fall for anything Sick. that he did. Did she meet him? Yes, yeah, she was in one of the classes with him. Oh, oh, she thought he was super handsome and everything. Mm-hmm. Wow. And so, Morley, what are some of your favorite horror movies? Um, anything with Adam Sandler or Will Ferrell. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I love Adam Sandler. Will Ferrell. I can I can take him or leave him on certain things. <laughs> <laughs> and so, Stephanie, do you currently have any sales or promotions on Wicked Cat Clothing? I'm offering your listeners 30% off their entire order with Uncovered 30. So with Uncovered 30, you get any item 30% off. And this will be, there's no end date. It's any time Uncovered 30 for your listeners. Great. So how can our listeners find you? So you can find me at wickedcatclothing.com. My Instagram is at wickedcatco. So just C-O. And then Facebook at Wicked Cat Clothing. Great. So Amazing. What, was there anything else that you wanted our listeners to know about Wicked Cat Clothing that we haven't think, already mentioned? I think I would like to let them know that I this is a passion of love. I put my heart and soul into it. I'm always open to ideas on sayings. I get customers reaching out to me saying, can you uh, use do this t-shirt? So anything anyone wants to reach out to me and ask, I do custom orders as well. I've done a lot of those. So just let me know. I'm on Facebook, Instagram, and you can email me through my website. Perfect. Sounds amazing. Well, Stephanie, it's been a pleasure having you as our guest. And I think our listeners will have found this as informative and as fun as we have. Yes. Thank you. I appreciate it. Thanks a lot for joining us, Stephanie. All the best. Yes. You as well. So on page 70, there's an interesting article. It's It's about health matters. And there's an article about Fugu. Fish Fatel. So for those of you who are not familiar with fugu, it is basically pufferfish. It's a Japanese delicacy, or when you order sushi, you can often order fugu. However, a number of people have died by eating improperly prepared fugu because it is so poisonous. In fact, 
I believe it's one of the most poisonous fish in the world. So something else I want to discuss, when you're getting sushi, um, there's a really good chance you're not getting the sushi you thought you're getting. So for example, if you ordered snapper, there's a chance you might be getting something like pollock, which is really the cheapest fish you can get. So often, when you order fish in a restaurant, especially sushi, you can't tell what you're getting. And the reason I mention this is because they've done studies numerous times and most people are actually unaware of what they're getting. Now, speaking of sushi, I want to talk a little bit about wasabi. So Steph, do you like wasabi? Uh, it's a little too spicy for me. Okay. So what most people don't know is that the wasabi that you're getting at uh, Japanese restaurants is not wasabi. It's actually green colored horseradish. And the reason is because wasabi is unbelievably expensive. It's like $100 an ounce or something like that. So it's far, far, far too expensive to use real wasabi. If you actually taste what you're getting, it's just horseradish. That's all it really is. Well, that makes sense. So Stephanie and I have a very, very quick uh, story about sushi. We were in um, at Turks and Caicos a number of years ago. And uh, Stephanie loves sushi. I don't eat it. I'm not into uh, fish. And we went to this restaurant and we took a look at the menu. And I said, Steph, I really want to take you here, but there's nothing on this menu I could eat. Normally there's chicken teriyaki or something I could eat. There was nothing. I, just I, sushi. Yeah. And I felt so badly because I never, ever wanted to deny Stephanie anything. And unfortunately, in this case, I could not eat a single thing. As it turns out, the very next day, some of the people... So we did not go. We did not we go. We did not go. Right. I said, I respect that. We'll go eat somewhere else. Right. Exactly. So I found out the next day that some of my colleagues who went to this restaurant were tied up for a couple of days with food poisoning. So that really, really worked out well. The moral of the story is be very careful about ordering sushi uh, at a tropical resort because you never know how it's, how it's stored, if it's improperly stored or what. There's more to the story as well. Be respectful to your partner's dietary uh, restrictions or needs finickiness pickiness yeah, exactly yes so sure, we'll go with that but i may have saved us yeah you so, did yes. anyway that was a pretty interesting little uh, tidbit there so page 122 brings us to an article entitled looking for challenge john kuzak so obviously this is an article about john kuzak i'll just give you the reader's digest version do you think kids these days know what reader's digest is that's a good question I'll give you the Wikipedia version, the like quick that. version, That's okay? Good. So John Cusack, he's an actor. I'm sure most people know. Some of his movies have included Class, Say Anything, and in this article he was actually promoting a movie entitled Fat Man, hmm, which I'm not familiar one. with. No. No. At the time of this article, he was living in Chicago with Jeremy Piven. Wow. Yeah. Remember him as Ari Gold from Entourage? Definitely. Oh, yeah. I love Entourage. Yeah, Great show. Too. And at the time, he was dating um, a singer-songwriter by the name of Susanna Mel Melvoin. I hope I'm saying her name correctly. Never, yeah, never heard of her. But... M-E-L-V-O-I-N. Okay. Um, she had actually worked with Prince. Oh, wow. She was known for her work with Prince. Oh, which one? Uh, Charles or Andrew or... No. Another one. Okay, got it. The, the, the one the, with the symbol name. The, the, oh, the short guy. Got May it. he rest in peace. Exactly. And do you have any favorite John Cusack movies? Yeah. Morley. You know, I used to see John Cusack movies all the time when I was in university, and what I remember most was this one line, and I remember the movie, it was probably Say Anything, but I think it was when he went up to a girl and said, how would you like, I'm paraphrasing here, how would you like a sexual experience so intense it'll change your political views? So I just thought that was such a great line. <laughs> uh, but anyway, but I, yeah, I was a big John Cusack fan at the time, and we're around the same age. Yeah, he's a great actor. I really like him, and... I really like the movie Say Anything. Right. Was that with um, Nicolette Sheridan? Was that the one? That was with Ione Sky. Okay. And he's holding up the, what do you guys call it now? Boom box? Boom box, we, yeah. Back in the day, we called it a boom box. Okay. He's holding up this boom box and playing um, Peter Gabriel's song. Okay. Uh, in, in Your Eyes. In Your Thank Eyes, Thank you. Yeah, okay. I, sorry. Yeah. In Your Eyes. Okay. Um, to Ione Sky, and that's a pivotal scene in the movie. Excellent movie. I actually really liked him in High Fidelity. Never saw that movie. It was really good. I liked it a lot. But anyhow, so that's John Cusack um, in Cosmopolitan 1989. Great. Yeah, he's a great actor. I really enjoy his work. And to this day, he's still very popular. So on page 150, there's an ad for Big Red Gum. No little cinnamon gum freshens breath longer than Big Red. Not that this ad is so amazing. It's, it's actually a cute little ad. But I want to talk about Big Red. Did you ever have that gum? 
For sure. Okay. Cinnamon gum. Yeah, that's yeah, right. Yeah. What, what tipped you off? The title? It says, No Little Cinnamon Gum Freshes. Anyway. So, <laughs> <laughs> um, the reason I'm mentioning this is because this is one of those gums, packs of gum, you couldn't really find in Canada, at least not where we lived. So... When we often would have uh, go to the U.S., we'd have an opportunity to purchase things that we couldn't normally get here. Big Red Gum was one of them. Another one was Fruit Stripe Gum. Remember Fruit Stripe? Yes. And there was another one, and I can't remember the name of it offhand, but it had that little gel in the middle. Oh, Starburst. Was it Star? No, 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 no. Fruit. Oh, my goodness. And oh. uh, it, it bothers me now. But oh, there's... my God. Me too. But it had like this little squirt oh. of like um, a peppermint or spearmint in the middle, and it was a gimmick, but it was absolutely great. We loved it. I'm going to have to Google that. That's yeah. really bothering me. Uh, but there's all these really cool products. So when we used to go to Buffalo, which would be a couple times a year, uh, I'd buy some gum that you couldn't get here, or my mother would buy the uh, Keebler Toll House cookies because we couldn't get them here. Pringles. Pringles are everywhere. But in the mid-70s, you can only buy them in the U.S., and it was such a unique thing, and we'd bring back Pringle, Pringles for everybody because you couldn't find them in, uh, in Toronto. I remember when Extra Gum came out, and it was completely different format in the U.S. It was like the long format, like the Wrigley's. Oh, okay. Instead of the short, like Trident. Right, you know what right. I mean? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And so that was another thing you would want to get from the U.S. Yeah. But now, when we, let's say, visit relatives in the U.S., like my brother, for example, Stephen, if you're listening. Uh, we Hi, like Stephen. To, hi, Stephen. Hi, Stephanie. Anyway, um, okay. We like to bring back, like, Kit Kat, Coffee Crisp, Smarties, things that you can't find in the U.S. We bring from Canada, so it's kind of cool. Anyway, I just wanted to talk a little bit about that ad and some of the, the fun things about cross-border shopping, which hopefully we'll be able to do again soon. On page 208, we have a two-page layout. It's entitled, The Real Thing, Classic Accessories That Seem Costly, But Maybe They Aren't. And the caption says, Diamonds are forever and so are fabulous accessories. Hold your breath. Plunge just once. That one big luxury will make everything in your closet look rich. So they're showcasing Chanel accessories, and basically we're looking at all, it's all red. Red was clearly trending fall October 1989. Everything is red, red suede, red leather, and gold, you know, the classic Chanel chains. But you know what's really cool about this, though? Mm -hmm. They say the real thing, like Coke. It's red like Coke. So that's what they're doing here. So the real thing, everything's in red, and it just reminds you of Coca-Cola. So I thought that was really clever, actually. I didn't think of that. That's a very astute well, cause, observation. Because the real thing is their slogan, right? It's That's the true. real thing. That's true. Coke. Yeah. So they stole it from Coke. They stole basically. it from Coke. Yeah, it just okay. make, it makes it easier to identify. So the purpose of this layout is they're pointing out that you can purchase quality classic accessories to elevate your look, mix high and low. You don't have to be designer head to toe, but you should um, splurge on a classic Chanel accessory right. to elevate your look. And... They're showing, it's a Chanel quilted mini belt bag, okay? okay yeah. And I'll tell you that in 1989, mm -hmm. they're giving the prices. The price was $555. Wow. Dollars. Wow. wow. That's a wow because you think that's expensive, right? Yeah. It's not. But how it's much, unheard of. But how much would it be in today's money? So, I don't... M my guess is probably around $1,500 bucks, probably. Yeah, inflation, right? Yeah. But I did Google... Um, this particular item on the Chanel website, and it's approximately thirteen hundred dollars US there today. Yeah, so it's almost the same so price if you, you think go. about it. Yeah, so probably so back then, yeah, with inflation, it's probably about the same. But um, I just myself want to point out that designer handbags are a good investment. They're known to be a good investment. They do retain their value. Right. They can be passed on. And my own personal observation is. Whether you get designer or not designer, this is an item, a handbag that you should spend a little more money on. Get something that you love. Get something that's good quality because it'll last you a long time and you'll wear it all the time and you'll get that enjoyment and you'll always look chic. And a nice handbag does elevate your look. So it did then, it does now. Yeah, I think it's a really clever article. I think there's some things you want to splurge on and some things you don't want to splurge on. And if you're going to get a handbag, hopefully you want to get one that's going to last not something that's going to fall apart or the zipper is going to break the following year. Exactly. So it is a good investment. I work with someone and she has a number of Gucci or uh, Louis Vuitton handbags and she uh, sells them. Yeah, but I'm telling you, ladies and gentlemen, this little belt bag, this little Chanel belt bag, if you got it in 1989 when this issue came out, you'd still be wearing it today because it looks exactly the same 
as the one they're show, that they're showing on the Chanel's website. Yeah, and the on Chanel's is, website. So. Yeah, and the quality is great, right? Yeah. You often get yeah. what you pay for. Yeah. So on page 176, there is a, a page it's called A Curmudgeon's Garden of Love by John Winokur, not to be confused with Anna Wintour. So I want to read a couple quotes. No instead. one's ever going to make that mistake. Except for me. All right. So I want to read a couple quotes. Uh, and maybe, Steph, you can do the same thing as well. Okay? All right. Uh, so here's a great quote from the incomparable Mae West. She has a lot of them. And she says, and here's my bad Mae West imitation, a man in the house is worth more than two on the street. So that was a cute little quote from Mae West. Yeah. Do you want to read uh, one or two, Steph? Sure. Love is the answer. But while you're waiting for the answer, sex raises some pretty good questions. Woody Allen. Oh, yes. He has, uh, he has a lot of good quotes about sex. He's great. Uh, here's one from Jane Mansfield. Men are those creatures with two legs and eight hands. That's a good one. <laughs> Zsa, Zsa Gabor. I know nothing about sex because I was always married. Speaking of Zsa, Zsa getting divorced just because you don't love a man is almost as silly as getting married just because you do. <laughs> and I'll give you the final words. This is fabulous. Yeah, Let great. me see. What do you guys want to hear? Let's go with Mae West. Okay. One more from Mae West. One more. I only like two kinds of men, domestic and imported. Perfect. Bravo, Mae West. Way to go. She is a legend. On page 212, we have a layout. It's entitled The Weekend Look Wonderful. The models are Marielle McAville and Michael Lemoyne. Photography by Michael O'Brien. Hair by Avram. And makeup by Sandrine Van Slee. And these are weekend looks. I'll read you a caption here. City standby, red leather with everything. So this is Marielle McAville. And by the way, this was her husband. Um, I hope I said his name correctly. Michael Le Lemoyne. Lemoyne. She's wearing red leather. It's, it's a weekend scene. So it looks like it seems they're going to a cottage. There's a photo of them packing up the car. There's a photo of them fishing over here hmm. she's wearing looks like she's rain wearing, boots looks like she's wearing these green rubbers and she's wearing this uh, green tartan yeah looks like they could be in ireland and she's wearing a lot of suede and i just want to say that i mean i had suede pants back in the late 80s early 90s now is this a micro and suede by halston or this is, is it? actually this is actual suede and okay. i just wanted to say like to go camping and up north and and whatever they're doing, I wouldn't think that was the most practical. In suede? No. I know I would ruin it for sure. Yeah, of course. I mean, that's crazy. She looks gorgeous. And we actually, we reviewed another issue, and it was a few years later. I think it was, I want to say, 1991 in one of our earlier episodes. Mm -hmm. and, we, and she was in the layout. Okay. And so was her husband. And so was her baby. Oh, wow. And this was like a couple of years after. So um, happy times. And I guess it was... Bring your family to work day. Oh, okay. Got it. But anyhow, uh, very nice. She She's pictured a lot with her family, which That's is nice. very nice. Actually, her, her husband here is mm -hmm. a model and actor. Oh, okay. So, very appropriate. They look very, they look nice. Yeah, they look great together. It's a, <laughs> it's a cool layout, and I like the uh, leather jacket she's wearing with the zippers. I was going to say, um, she's wearing a motorcycle jacket yeah. on the first page, and that never that's never gone out of style. Well, she's on the back of it. looks like a Triumph motorcycle. Yeah. It is. That's cool. And the, I don't know where, you know, motorcycle jackets, moto jackets started. I think Maybe. it started in the 20s, probably. Yeah, so. I remember James Dean. Long before that. Elvis. Yeah, long before that. And, you know, here they're still going strong, and she's wearing one in red leather, which yeah. is, again, red is very on trend. This is fall, yeah. 1989. And looking beautiful, and it's a great-looking layout. So Yeah, it's very cool. I'm glad you brought that up. That's the weekend look. Yeah. So that's Cosmopolitan, October 1989. Hope you enjoyed the episode. Thank you very much for listening. If you'd like to see more great vintage fashion magazines, please feel free to check out my store, Great Mags, on eBay and on Etsy. And how do you spell that? G-R, number eight, M-A-G-Z. And how do you say the last letter in Indonesian? We have a lot of listeners from uh, Jakarta. Don't even bother. Okay, so it's G R H. Also, <laughs> you can find us on Instagram. Also, G-R, number eight, M-A-G-Z. Or at uncovered underscore VFMR on Instagram. On Twitter, our handle is at uncovered VFMR. And our email, if you want to reach us by email, we love getting listener emails, is uh, Yahoo, which is uncoveredpodcast at yahoo.com. So thanks again for listening. Thanks for listening.